Good morning, good afternoon actually, everyone. Good afternoon, good to see you here. Welcome to the campus of Calvin University. My name is Greg Elzinga and I have the pleasure of serving as the interim president of Calvin. And today is an exciting day as we host the inaugural lecture of the Ajakai Lecture Series. And I have the pleasure of telling you a little bit about how this got started. We rejoice for the founders of this series, Calvin alumnus Don Lottie Verheyen and his wife, Olu Verheyen, who have chosen to honor the legacy and impact of Don Lottie's mother, physicist Dr. Deborah Ajakaye, through their gifts to Calvin University. Dr. Ajakaye made history as the first black female physics professor on the continent of Africa. She earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, her master's degree from the University of Birmingham in the UK, she later obtained her PhD in geophysics from Amadou Bello University. Dr. Ajakaye is not only a gifted mathematician, but also a trailblazer in higher education, society, and Christian leadership. Throughout her career, she has influenced numerous students as a professor and made significant contributions to locating Nigerian groundwater and mineral deposits even after her official retirement in 1991, she continued her missional work through the nonprofit organization she founded, Christian Care for Widows, Widowers, the Aged, and Orphans. The Ajakaye Corridor in Heminga Hall here on Calvin's campus is a tribute to Dr. Ajakaye and other influential women of African descent and honors their accomplishments in various fields including STEM, art, music, social change, and business. Established at the same time as the corridor, the lecture series invites guest speakers to campus who emphasize the importance of cross-cultural understanding, the beauty of cultural diversity, and the value of cross-cultural intelligence for Calvin students. We thank God for the Verheyen's vision for this series, for the legacy of thought leadership of Dr. Deborah Ajakaye, and for our speaker, Dr. Wendy Okolu, bringing her innovation her experience, her expertise, and her advocacy, and a willingness to share with us today. I remember when I first met Dr. Ajakai when she came for the dedication of the corridor. She was a, a humble and beautiful spirit, a wonderful lady uh, whose legacy we're excited to uh, launch here today with our, our inaugural lecture. So, uh, Wendy, welcome to Calvin University. Uh, please join me in welcoming. Uh, Nigel Likely, our Chief Diversity Officer, who's going to also provide an introduction. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Dr. Okolo is an aerospace engineer researcher in the Intelligent Systems Division at NASA Ames Research Center, conducting research and leading cross-functional teams in aerospace vehicle controls and systems health monitoring. In a nutshell, she works at NASA Center in Silicon Valley, making things fly safer and more efficiently. At the age of 26 year old, she became the first black woman to obtain a PhD, to obtain a PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Texas at Arlington. Her graduate studies were recognized and funded by the Depar US Department of Defense through the Natural Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellowship Zonata International through the Armella Earnhardt Fellowship, the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics at the Texas Space Grant Consortium. She also received a resolution of commendation from the Tarrant County Circuit Court of Texas and an award for excellence in research by women of color in STEM. At, at NASA, Dr. Okolo has been honored with the 2001 NASA Exceptional Technology Achievement Medal, the 2020 NASA Ames Award for Research Scientists, and the 2019 NASA Ames Early Career Researcher Award. The first woman to receive the Ames Early Center Research Award, she is also the recipient of the 2019 UT Arlington Distinguished Recent Graduate Award, the 2000 Woman in Aerospace Award for Initiative, Inspiration, and Impact, the 2019 Black Engineer of the Year Award for Most Promising Engineer in the U.S. Government. As an avid supporter of changing the narrative of underrepresentation in STEM, particularly for young girls, career women, and people of color, 
She served as the NASA Ames Special Emphasis Programs Manager for Women, ensuring the recruitment, retention, and promotion of women. Her initiatives include creating nursing rooms for mothers to ease their transition back to work, and analyzing job language usage in position descriptions to remove gendered language biases that reduce female applicants. In recognition of her work in enabling diversity, inclusion, and equity, she was honored with the NASA Ames Honor Award for Diversity and Equal Opportunity. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Wendy Okolo. Good afternoon. What a great turnout. Wow. I am honored and truly, truly thankful to be here. Thanks to everyone that has put this together, and I can't wait to spend my afternoon with you um, today. When, um, be before I get started, I just want a quick logistics administrative. We'll have some opportunity for Q&A at the end. So Jane has asked me to tell you that if you have questions, text this number. You can take a picture of it so you don't forget, but I'll put it up at the very, very, very end of the slides as well. When I was a child, I wanted two things. I wanted to be an engineer, and I wanted to be left alone. Left alone by my sisters to take over the TV in the living room to watch Cinderella and Tom and Jerry and Baby's Day Out on repeat every day left alone to play me with my whisked talking tablet and just do what I wanted, left alone to skip recess. I didn't like recess much. I didn't like to get dirty and be pushed and, God forbid, like bruise my knee. It was just too much. It's a little interesting child, but when people found out I wanted to be an engineer, they didn't leave me alone. You want to be an engineer? Wow, you must be really smart. What kind of engineer do you want to be? I don't know. Well, I wanted to be an engineer because my parents put it in my head when I was a child. Growing up to Nigerian parents in the late 80s, early 90s, your parents decided what you were going to be when you grew up. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be an engineer. You're going to be a lawyer. Or you're going to move out of the house. <laughs> right? So you had, you had options. It wasn't like they didn't give you options. So. It worked out for me. I told everyone I wanted to be an engineer. And then one day in the third grade, uh, my teacher asked the class what we wanted to be when we grew up. I already knew. I want to be an engineer. You want to be an engineer? You want to fix ceiling fans for a living? <laughs> and the class laughed with her when she laughed. And I was mortified. I was so ashamed. I told my mom when I got home, I don't want to be an engineer anymore. Why? They fix ceiling fans. Who said that? My teacher said it. What? She doesn't know what she's talking about. You know, and she called her a number of names. <laughs> um, but she was able to reaffirm, you know, the interest that she had created for me in engineering and by telling me about the really, really cool things engineers got to do. Things like planes and rockets and spaceships and buildings and infrastructure and architecture and things that make the world a better place for all of us. And I tell this story to everyone, and it's a reminder even to me that no one is exempt from adversity. Not a six-year-old child. I was six at the time, and definitely not you. So if you think life is hard, it's hard for a lot of us. It's hard for the kids, it's hard for the adults, but you gotta keep going, right? You gotta keep going. So I kept going and graduated through, you know, elementary school, secondary school in Lagos, Nigeria, moved to Texas at 16 to do this engineering thing that I had told everybody I was gonna do. And um, before I moved, my sisters had told me to take the SATs I wasn't quite required to take it, but they're like, yeah, take the SATs. They didn't take it, but they're like, take it so you can get straight into college and all blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay. So I took it, and I wasn't quite required to take it, but when I took it um, and submitted as part of my application to the University of Texas, there are all the cool things that they were doing with their research and work, and 
would get like four homework problems once a week while the others would get like 20, which just seemed really difficult, was a way for hardworking students to get by easier. Mind-blowing, right? So just because it's not required doesn't mean it doesn't end up being useful. And there are a lot of things that can make your life easier if you just stay open, right? And I still, I still remember that now and then and tell myself, um, even with my extracurricular involvement today, there are so many things that are not required for me to do for work. I'm not required to be here. <laughs> I won't get fired if I don't. But I enjoy it, and I get to meet people that get younger and younger each year as I get older and older. Such a beautiful group of students that I've met with this morning, just inspiring. I'm like, ah, oh, I miss those days, you know? But, but just because it's not required doesn't mean it's not useful, and sometimes you have to do the things that are not required for you to do. Um, so I didn't really have much of a resume growing up. I didn't think much about a resume, um, but I got into the habit later and even now of keeping track of all of the things that I do. And it doesn't have to be extensive, right? When you read nonfiction books, there are all these lists of things that you should do to increase productivity. Journal, write 10 pages about your day. Who has time? Who? Who has time to write all these things? But sometimes it's just a quick note of what you did today, right? Um, is there anyone here that's not a student that's in here and thinking potentially that this is professional development? This is professional development. Your presence here is professional development, right? You're bettering yourself, even if it's one hour, you're here taking the time out to be here, putting yourself just a little bit ahead. And so for the students, I want you to remember to start to keep track of these little things because when people meet you and ask you, what do you do for fun? Who are you? You can answer. You can answer. You can say what you do with your time instead of just looking stumped and, uh, I don't know, I like to play video games. I'm an engineer, right? You know, there are things that you can answer with if you just kind of keep track, but these are the building blocks of your resume. This seemingly complex thing is just a one-pager that says who you are and what you do, and people can see and have that easily accessible. So try to get into that habit of um, keeping track of what you do, and I do it even now. I do it till now because sometimes you're stumped, and you're stuck, and you don't know what direction you should go. It's really one of the things I think that sparks innovation for me because when I'm working on something and working and working and chugging and it seems like I'm not making much progress, sometimes I have to remember who I am and what are all the different threads of things that I do and those collaborations with the different groups of people that I work with can be the push that helps to drive that innovation, right? So remember who you are, know who you are by writing down who you are and it'll help you, right? Just, just keeping track of the things you do. This one's a big deal because I said I wanted to be an engineer, but I didn't say what kind of engineer I wanted to be, right? So I got into college being Nigerian. You know, oil was discovered in the Niger Delta region of Nigeria in the 1960s, and everyone wanted to be a petroleum engineer or electrical. And petroleum, chemical, oh, you're going to make a lot of money. You're going to be rich. But I was like, this sounds boring. <laughs> You know, I, hey, no shade, no shade to the petroleum and chemical engineers in here or those who have parents that are, but I just thought about those hard hats and just trudging through like, you know, I was like, this seems like a lot. So I took that out of my list. And then there was mechanical engineering and there was aerospace engineering. Hmm, mechanical engineers can get to work on anything, right? They can do whatever they want. But then it's still kind of broad, so I don't know what kind of engineering I want to be. Aerospace is really fascinating. Space, everyone's obsessed with space. If you're a pastor to your neighbor's daughter, space is cool. People ask me about aliens. I don't know, man. I don't, I don't have them. I don't have aliens in my basement. And I'm, if, if we had aliens at work, the military would probably take them. I don't, I don't have aliens, you know. But there are all these theories because space is pretty fascinating. So I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to do aerospace. I'm not so sure, but I'm going to decide on something and I'm going to move with it. 
and I met an industrial engineering professor who made it really, really, really cool. Industrial engineering is so cool. They make everything better. From lines at the post office to working at Coca-Cola, I'm like, oh, this seems cool. But I was just too lazy and lethargic to change. So I say this to say, keep moving. And just because you don't have all the details of what you want to do, or what you want to be, the big picture without all the details is still a picture. Wasn't it Dali that used to create all those grainy, grainy pictures that were abstract? You just throw paint. It's a picture. Now you're renowned, right? But I feel the same way about what we do. You don't have to have all of the details to keep moving. Just don't be still. Don't be stagnant. Don't feel like you have to know it all to push a little forward and to push ahead a little bit, okay? Um, so I stuck with engineering, aerospace engineering. I didn't know that I was going to end up at NASA. I didn't. I thought I was going to work a corporate job. I was telling um, Marcus and, and Co. this morning that I thought I was going to wear heels and click, click through the hallways of the coolest aerospace engineering job. But then I, I found myself doing research, fell in love with it, and ended up at NASA. So keep moving. Um, I like this one because it's just... Organic friendships really and relationships really are the best. So sometimes when we study, so when I, when I got into college, I took my first calculus test, the honors calculus test. We had quizzes every week and failed. I took the second one and I failed. There's like the first one I got four over 10, the second I got like six over 10 or something. And that's failing to me. I was stumped because I thought I was smart. I was like, hello. I mean, this honors college, I'm smart, but I was with other really, really, really smart kids. And so what I did was I had friends in this class that um, I started to study with. And because we were similar, like at a similar place, there were people in that class that were way smarter than me, but I didn't pick them to study with because one, they weren't my friends, and two, there's nothing appealing about studying with someone that takes two minutes to solve what takes you 10 minutes, right? That will be nothing but an exercise in your own fertility, uselessness, and failure. I am not interested in being reminded of how inept I am. So I studied with my friends and my peers, and we rose together. And the next test I took, I got a 10 over 10. And the one after that, it was a 10 over 10 and a 9 over 10, and a 10 over 10, and then I got my 4.0 GPA. There is a theory, I think of the Goldilocks effects, that talks about how humans are motivated um, by something that is just not, it's difficult enough, but not too difficult, so like, like a happy medium, right? And that was what I found with my friends, and even till date, the best collaborations with people that work, or the people that I get along with the most, my very first patent was, it came about like that. When I started at NASA the following year, there was an opportunity to propose something to the Space Technology Mission Directorate that we could get $2.5 million to study whatever we wanted. That was interesting to the Space Technology Mission Directorate. So, but it had to be early career you know, individuals. And I had early career friends and we got together we put this proposal together, we made a video, we had to make a video and, you know, and submit it with the proposal. And we won. One of two agencies, one of two teams across the entire agency, across the United States, right? NASA has different centers. And there were 30 submitted and we were one of two that won. And we did this work, it was really cool. Young people that were really interested in making a deployable spacecraft. A deployable spacecraft is something that, like, takes off stowed, you know, in the capsule, and then when it enters the atmosphere of whatever's going to enter, poof, it deploys. And the one we're working with actually was like an umbrella. Well, how do you control something that deploys like an umbrella? Like, where do you put the control surfaces and the engines? And, you know, so it was complex, and we had to figure that out. And last year, we got our first patent based on that work. And that was just because it was a team of people that I really, really, really enjoyed working with. So find your crew right? And be organic with it. Don't just befriend people because they're really smart or they have something to offer you, right? Find your crew and, and, and grow together. Sit in front of the class. <laughs> sit in front. This is like, no one tells you this, but sit in front of the class whenever you can. 
Sit in front of the class, learn to listen, and be kind. Your professors really can see everything. You know when I figured this out? After I graduated undergrad. I mean, I used to sit in front, but I didn't know they could see everything. When I got into grad school and I became a teaching assistant, sometimes I would have to sub for the professor. And I got in the front of the class to teach. I could see everyone. I could see who was texting. I'm like, oh. <laughs> oh, you. Okay. Oh, 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 that's okay. That's what y'all are doing here. You know, but it makes a difference when your teacher can see you and see that you don't get it. Because they'll go back and explain a little better. But if you're in the back and you don't get it, they can't tell. If you're in the back tick-tocking or thinking about food, they can't tell. I was so in tune with my professors that, oh, they knew. They knew when Wendy, I'm like. <laughs> and they will spend more time and I would get it. And what that did for me was I was optimizing, really, really maximizing my time as a student. So I could get back home. Engineering, any engineering students in here? What do you do with your time? Homework. <laughs> Homework. Homework. That's it. But what do you do? You get back, you know, to your dorm or whatever after class, and you have to do homework. But if you don't understand the material, first you have to study and then do the homework. So you just waste that time in class, and you're going to come back, you're going to study, and then do the homework, and then you're going to be like, oh my god, I'm so stressed. Engineering is so hard. I didn't even... You did this to yourself. <laughs> All your wounds are self-inflicted. You should have paid attention in class, right? Right? You did this. So don't hustle backwards. Pay attention, sit in front, learn to listen, and be kind. If your professor cracks a joke that's not funny, you don't have to laugh. You can smile, because <laughs> you know how hard it is there. You know that they're trying, right? It's not easy. It's not easy. So sit in front of the class, learn to listen and be kind. Your professors can see everything, and reputation is everything, right? Reputation makes a difference. If you have a reputation for someone that pays attention, that's positive, they talk. Let me tell you, your professors talk. Just in case you think they don't notice you, they know, and they talk. Jane and I have already talked this morning <laughs> about the students. We, we know who's that girl, you know, but they notice, they talk, and reputation is important. You want to have a good one, but your reputation speak for you. Let it precede you. Be positive, be kind. It's not always easy, but just sit in front, okay? Okay. Uh, start strong if you can. I met a bunch of freshmen in here uh, this morning, and it was nice to see the excitement, the exuberance, and you, you, I mean, it's, you basically have a blank sheet. I'm not saying if you're a senior, there is no opportunity to change. There, there always is. But if you can't start strong, it's easier to maintain a high GPA than to bring one that's low up for a number of reasons, reputation being one of them, right? If you're a 4.0 student, you got 4.0 all A's for three years, who is that professor that's going to start you out with that B? Let me see him. Show me. Right? It's not as easy. You, if you get that B, you really deserve it, right? You know, it's, and it happens, right? It happens. But reputation is everything. If you have a reputation, a good reputation starting, it's easier to maintain that good reputation. Life is easier for you, I tell you, if you already have a good standing. People are more forgiving, more accepting. Oh, you had a hard semester with this test. And engineering, professors grade on a curve, right? It's not always about 90 and above, it's about how well the class did. Some professors do, others don't. I don't know, man, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but just, you know, start strong if you can, really. Get involved. Is there anyone here that is not a member of any student organization? Everyone here is part of a student organization. Uh-huh. Just put your hands up, let me see. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and you know, it, it's okay. I, when I started out, you know, as a freshman, I, I really wasn't involved. I was trying to get the lay of the land. And I had this female upperclassman. She was a junior at the time that, hey, Wendy, do you know about the Society of Women Engineers? Yeah, you told me last week. Hey, Wendy, do you know about the... I'm like, yeah, you already told me. Hey, Wendy, she would follow me around, and you should come to one of our meetings. I'm like, why? 
Why must I come? I didn't understand the importance of being part of an organization and being part of having a tribe, having your people that are going through the same things, can gripe with you about the crappy professors, can tell you don't take class A with class B the same semester or you'll struggle, right? It's important to have that community. So, but join, be part of a community, be part of a student organization, but serve, sit on the board of that organization, right? Um, give back, you get stuff out of it too. In addition, being part of an organization, you get to meet upperclassmen easily that can tell you and teach you from their struggles. If I tell you how many people have asked me to mentor them, Parents alike, students alike. Can you mentor my child? Like my mentor mentee list should be at least a thousand right now, <laughs> you know. But I'm like, this mentorship you seek is not really what you need right now. You need the mentor for the next phase. You need the mentor that's a senior for your freshman student. Then when they became become a senior. They need a mentor that's an early career professional. Like they really, really need these things. They can get the upper, you know, upper level mentors, but the things that they need right now are the, how do you move from here to there? How do you move from A to B? You can go from A to Z, you know, but good luck, man, <laughs> right? So that's how you meet those mentors. That's how you're able to get by easier. That's how you know, because your advisors will help you, but they're not students like you, right? And they're in different places. You want that feedback from an upperclassman. So get involved, serve on the board of an organization. That's how you also know what's going on in terms of potential career fairs, internships. That's how you get an internship without an interview. I didn't have to interview till like I was done with grad school. I never had to interview for anything. I showed up, got to meet people, gave my resume. Okay, yeah, you can start. Yeah, next summer, yeah, we'll have a position for you, right? So network, get involved, sit on the board of an organization, give back, don't be a lone ranger, okay? Community, community is everything. Do hard things, at least one, at least one hard thing, and you define it. You define what that hard thing is. Ideally, one non-academic hard thing. For me, it was dance in college. I was in a dance team, the African Students Organization dance team, and we had practice for four hours on Wednesdays, no, on Saturday, Saturday mornings that I should have been sleeping in. I woke up to go do dance practice. Wednesdays for two hours, and then I was an RA too. I was a resident assistant, I had to do RA training, I had to, in the middle of the night, settle conflicts and disputes. Which roommate is pressing the thermostat? Which roommate is making noise at night? Which, you know, these little things I had to do that I had to get involved in. Do hard things because, and I recommend doing hard things because they really help you persist through the academic challenges. When things get tough, you already have that mental discipline. You already have strengthened your, your, your resilience muscles. And it helps me today, too. Um, I started running during the pandemic. It's hard. It is the worst. <laughs> but, but it's a hard thing that has helped me, you know, push through, you know, my mental resilience and, and flexing. When I graduated with my undergrad degree, uh, right, in fact, the year before I graduated, I thought I was gonna work at Lockheed Martin, get a full-time job and work there. And then that year in 2009, the Obama administration scaled down the Constellation program and the people that had job offers already at Lockheed Martin had them retracted started to offer this MAV grad engineering program, which was a bachelor's to a PhD. You get to skip the master's if your GPA was high enough and you've basically already demonstrated a record of excellence. So I was like, okay, fine. I like school anyway, I'll go to grad school. I don't know what research is, but I'll do it. And I got to go and do my PhD in aerospace engineering because I happened to be in the right place at the right time and prepared. Luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Stay ready, right? Stay ready, keep your eyes and ears to the ground and know what's going on around you. I got to do this work with like aircraft flight information, like when birds 
geese, when they are migrating, they fly in these extended V formations. They do that because the ones behind use up less energy when they, when they travel like that, when they fly like that. You can apply the same idea to planes. Now, they don't have to fly as close and people are going to freak out, oh my God. No, you know, they can be in really, really staggered formations and for airplanes flying in those formations, this is just a simulation that I put together years ago just to kind of show what those formations are and I put it such that the plane at the back, something bad will happen to it. So just to see something cool. But the ones behind, less energy for planes is less, less what? Fuel, less fuel. And even like half a percent of 1% of fuel is a big, big deal. So I got to study this for five years and look at how you could control the trail aircraft when there were bad things happening to it and get more of those benefits in conjunction with the Air Force Research Lab, my amazing professor at the University of Texas at Arlington, just because I said, yes, sure, I'll go to a PhD. That sounds cool, right? So stay ready, stay ready. Um, while I was in grad school, I also got to work at Skunk Works, which is Lockheed Martin's advanced development programs in Fort Worth, Texas. There's a location in California. Skunk Works, the Skunk Works team were the ones that created the SR-71 Blackbird, which is a really, really cool plane that books and movies have been made about, you know. And it's, it's a big deal, and it's really, really smart people, and I got to work with that group, right, of today, and work on the F-35C, which is a fighter jet aircraft. And I have a, that's a picture of it there. This F-35C is a fighter aircraft for the US Navy. And those flaps in the back are control surfaces, and they're used to control the plane and make it go, you know, the way the pilot or the crew wanted to, to go. And so this plane flies in a very optimized fashion, and we were told to make it even more optimal. So the team I met with, you know, I was working with already had this line of code and they were figuring this thing out and they were so smart. And I was like, what, how did I get here? And I went back to the code and just tried to understand it. And I found a bug in the code my first week there, just cause I tried to understand it and fixed it. I just went, hey, what does this mean? Why do we have a negative here and a negative here? It's like, oh, Wendy fixed it, wow, wow. That, and you know, our code converged and Someone said I should get a raise. I didn't. <laughs> but, but yeah, but that due diligence and just going through when you don't understand anything, it trumps that imposter syndrome every time, every time. I want to say I'm still learning to fly. Last year, February, over a year ago, February 10th, I lost my father tragically. Um, he was killed by a drunk driver. And it was my very first experience and foray with grief so close to me. And it taught me that tomorrow's promise no one. It sounds trite, but it's true. Perfectly healthy man was gone. And there's no time, the time that you think you have. Can't guarantee it. And I've been working on Learn to Fly for a while. And that, losing my father, gave me the impetus, the push to really release it and put it out into the world because I wasn't sure, is it ready? Is it ready? Is it good enough? And I put it out into the world and had not one but two meetings and interviews with Neil deGrasse Tyson, who released the book about the same time. First, we did an Amazon Live together. Then he invited me on his Star Talk radio podcast to talk all things aerospace. What an honor, right? Just because... I put it into the world. I'm still learning to fly. I hope you are too. Um, and it's never really a final thing. Be grateful. Say thank you to these people, to the little people. Express gratitude. Stay positive. And get a copy of the book. Jane has some. I think, yeah, we might have a little extra. There's a QR code. Everything that I've shared, well, most of everything I've shared is in the book. If you have more questions, you can connect with me. You can text the number that I showed in the slide here, and I'm happy to answer more questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming.